Wow, I'm so excited, really excited to get into this new series with you guys called All In. And what a timely, I think, message um, and a challenge for us to accept. It really is, is connected to, if you missed last Sunday's six-year anniversary celebration service, I'd love for you to go online, check that out, because it really is, is a continuation of this thought that we started and we unpacked last Sunday. And, and, and one of the scriptures we read was from Joshua, where Joshua challenged the people. He said, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord's going to do amazing things among you. And I know that word consecrate may, may sound like a religious Bible term, but, but that word means fully devoted. That if you just fully devote yourselves, we would see God move powerfully in our lives. And that's why we're doing this series um, all in. Because the key, the key to this whole Christian thing, this faith thing, you guys, is to put both feet in is to actually go in with all you are, all your heart. It actually does not work any other way because if you hold out on God, he holds out on you. You cannot receive the best has, God has to offer when you're not all in. And so one of my greatest fears as a pastor is that, is that people can come to church their entire lives and never go all in with Jesus. And, and so they can, they can follow the rules, but that doesn't mean they're following Jesus. And, and so when Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 4, come, follow me, I think that some of us misinterpret the call to go all in, to follow Jesus. I think some of us are afraid of going all in, man, and giving God our whole hearts. When, listen, when Jesus called the disciples, come, follow me, he was not calling them to total perfection. Please listen. He was calling them to total devotion. And there's a difference. See, these disciples who accepted the call to follow Jesus and to go all in, they were not perfect. They were very flawed. They had, they had blunders and fumbles and, and mess ups. And I'm so thankful for the word of God does not like put these disciples on a pedestal. We're able to see their human nature. God was not calling them to be perfect or to follow a list of rules. He was calling them to follow him for a, a life of not full perfection, but a full devotion, a fully devoted life. And, and so what does that look like? The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 says it like this. He, I think a really good picture of what full devotion looks like. This is going to be kind of an anchor verse for us in this series that we'll be studying together along with some other challenges of Jesus to go all in. Here's how the Apostle Paul says it. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you because you need God's help to do this, okay? You can't do it yourself. He says, here's what I want you to do. You need God's help. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life. Don't, don't compartmentalize God and say, okay, God, you have the spiritual part of me. Okay, God, I give you my Sunday. No, no, no. Go all in. Be fully devoted. Take your everyday life, your ordinary life, like everything. He goes, he says, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and place that before God as an offering. And he says, embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And we're going to talk about that, how we can just get really uh, fit. We can fit so well to the culture around us. Instead, he says, fix your attention on God. Like, like, what if God was the focal point of your life? What if, you're, what if he was the attention and of your affection? He says this, you'll be changed from the inside out. That's what will happen if you go all in with God. you actually experience transformation. Look, you need to, God says, consecrate yourself, and I'll do amazing things among you. Some of you need to stop trying so hard to make an amazing life. That's God's job. Your job is to give your whole heart. Your job is to fully devote yourself. It's God's job. He's going to do the amazing things. God says, look, I, I'll do it. You just go all in, put your attention here, go all in with me, and I'll change you from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, here's what God wants to do. God wants to bring out the best in you. And by the way, that's the only, you, cannot, you cannot be the best you that there is apart from God. You can't. God is your creator, is your designer. Is, he's the only one that can bring the best out of you because he is your designer. God wants to bring out the best of you to develop what, what he's saying, well-informed maturity inside of you. So what prevents us 
from this life? What prevents us from fully devoting, from going all in with God? And, and, and I believe that a, one of the big reasons I want to discuss today is we have a divided devotion. Our devotion is divided. So we say, like, I do love God. There's a part of me, at least, that loves God and wants to do the God things. But there is, if we're honest, other parts of us that are devoted to other things. We're not fully devoted. We have a divided devotion. And so there's other, there's other things sitting on the throne of our heart other than God. Anything, anything that is other than God, that is, that is first place, that is on the throne of your heart, is what the Bible calls an idol. And, and, and the, the fact is, there are, there are a lot of little G gods, idols, little G gods, fighting for your affection, for your time, for your devotion, and for your worship in this life. You know, in, in the Bible, we read all throughout you know, the scriptures, it talks about idolatry. And so there, there are thousands of verses about this topic. There's over 50 laws that the Jewish people had that had to do with idolatry. It was one of the four sins that you would commit. And if you would commit that sin, it's the death of penalty. So there's a lot about it in the Bible, Old and New Testament, but I think a lot of us read about idolatry and idols in the Bible, and, and for many of us, we think, well, that's antiquated, that's old, that's irrelevant. We really don't deal with that here in our culture, in our life today, and I would, so you say like, oh, it's not really our struggle, and I would, I'm going to make the case today that it is not just a struggle, it is the struggle of our life, because whichever God um, sits on the throne of our heart is the God that has control and power over us. Ultimately, the God we choose determines the destiny we receive, the destiny that we walk in. So on the surface, it may not seem like, well, there isn't really much I, I, idol worship going on, but it is the struggle. So for instance, you may struggle with anxiety or worry, but maybe it's because control and security are your God. You may be losing the war and the battle of lust but maybe because sex is your God. Or maybe you struggle with legalism because religious rules and rituals are your God. Maybe it's, it's you know, you're discontent. Maybe it's money. Maybe you lack self-control, and it could be that pleasure is your God. See, any, anything underneath every sin is a false God that is sitting on a throne of our hearts. And until that false God is dethroned, you'll never have victory in your life. You never. An idol is anything that takes the focus off of God and puts it on something else. When anything is first in my life other than God, that is an idol in my life. And it could even be a good thing. We can even place good things on. And listen, it could be good, but it's not God and it doesn't deserve the throne. Can I, can I get an amen, you guys? We can even put good things as the, as the, on the throne of our hearts and it turns into idolatry. Let me show you a well-known verse in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. Um, I am, God says, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in Egypt. So God says, hey, I, I brought you out of some things. You remember that? I did that. I'm the one who set you free. I'm the one who rescued you. Do not worship any other gods besides me. Do not make idols of any kind, whether in the shape of birds or animals or fish. He says, you must never worship or bow down to them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You say, wow, is God jealous? Yeah. Not like your ex-girlfriend jealous, but he's a jealous God. Like, like he, does, he does not share his throne. His throne only has one seat. He does not share your heart. He says, I, I won't share that. I'm, I'm jealous. I won't share your affection with any other God. So what are idols? In essence here, in the sense that we're talking about, it means anything we value more than God. See, some people park their idols in their garage every day. Some people put their, put their gods in safe deposit box or in their bank account every month. They come in all kinds of, see, we don't have, we don't have like gods of stone or iron and metal like they, they used to, but here are, the, here are some of the three main gods in the Bible in, in biblical times. Baal was the god of sex, Mammon was the god of money, and Molech was the god of violence. And I know we don't have, you know, gods that are metal today. We just pay billions of dollars to go watch movies with sex, money, and violence. Yeah, there you go. Ouch or amen. Someone say it, right? Well, well, wait a second, Pastor, though. I don't bow down and, and worship these gods. Like, I'm not, I'm not like idol worshiping any of these gods. Oh, really? Let me ask you a question. Where is your sanctuary? So w when you're hurting, where do you run to? So let's say you had a bad day at work, had a bad day in the office. You go home, and then you go to what? 
you go to the refrigerator for your comfort food, maybe some ice cream? Do you pick up the phone? Go to the phone? Call a trusted friend to vent to? Right? Where do you go when you're, when, you, when you're emotionally spent? Where do you go when you, when you need to recharge? Maybe do, do you find rescue or, or in, a, in, a, in a novel, in, a, in movies, in entertainment, in, in video games, in pornography? Where do you go? Here's why it's important. Because the high ground that we seek reveals the geography of our, val- of our values. See, God, the Bible says that God's name is a strong tower. Those who run to it are kept safe. And that sounds great, but we forget it so easily and we run off in all these different directions and we put other things before God. In Deuteronomy chapter four, God says, for your own good. This is actually good for you. Hey, church, Every command of God is not just for his benefit. Please listen. It's for your good. God's not just getting like, like kicks and giggles by telling you to do stuff. Just no, he's, he's actually, it's for your good that he's commanding you for your own good. Don't sin by making an idol in any form at all. See, idols come in a lot of shapes and in, in a lot of different sizes and a lot of different forms. And I want to show you why. Why is this so important to God? that you would not put anything else on that throne that was designed specifically for him. Because when you put anything else, an idol, when an idol sits on that throne, it has some very disastrous effects in our lives. And some of us have been experiencing some of these effects because within our life in different places, something else is on the throne. I want you to see it. Take some notes. Here's, here's what happens because idols will disappoint you. See, this is idols over promise and under deliver, don't they? Oh, if you, oh it'll, it'll make you happy. It'll give you pleasure. This will give you security. This will make you free. This, and it's just an over, all idols over promise and under deliver. I don't know if you've seen those like TV commercial ads, all of them over promise, under deliver, right? Drink this and you're gonna, you're gonna play in the NFL. This is what's gonna happen, okay? So it's basically, or brush your teeth with this and your teeth will not only be white, but they will become straight. Look at this model right here. <laughs> Or have you seen those medicinal warnings? Those pharmacy companies, you know, they got to put it in the commercial now, which makes it so awkward to listen to the list of, hey, you got acne? Take this. And in some cases, you know, it goes on explosive diarrhea, bloody nose, you know, fainting, death. <laughs> and in some cases, in rare cases, acne. What? Wait a second. <laughs> they will always disappoint you. Look what Jeremiah chapter 10, 14 says. Those who make idols are disillusioned because the gods they make are false and lifeless. I don't know if you've, maybe you've bought something online or, or on a catalog and you got it and you're so disappointed. You're like, wait a second, this wasn't what the picture was. Okay. Anytime that you, anything other than God that you put your hope in, you say, I'm going to get, I'm going to get my happiness from this. I'm going to get security from this. This is, it will always disappoint you. Idols will always disappoint you. Here's the second thing idols will do. Idols will dominate you. They will, they will desire to take control. If you don't watch out, they will end up controlling your whole life. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, Before you knew Christ, two things happened. Look, at you were controlled by dead idols, and you were led astray by them. Those two, if you don't watch out, those two things will happen. You will, you will be controlled by these false idols. And in, in a term today, instead of idol that we use in our culture, I think it's called addiction. And you can be addicted to a lot of other things, right? You could be addicted to sex. You could be addicted to pleasure. You could be addicted to success. You could be addicted to career or money. You could be addicted to a lot of other things other than alcohol and drugs. He says, watch out. They'll control you or they'll lead you astray. You'll lose perspective of your life if an idol is sitting on the throne of your heart where God ought to be. How many people, because of the lure of promotion, abandon their family and their kids' developmental ages that were so crucial in their life? Or maybe because of, of the, the promise of fame, they compromise their integrity. God says, you don't watch out an, 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 an idol. Anything you love more than God will end up distracting you and you'll lose your values, it'll dominate your life. Here's the third thing an idol will do. An idol will deform you. 
Like an idol, it'll change you. It'll warp you. It'll twist you. You'll lose your God-given personality. The uniqueness that makes you you will be changed. Some of you can see this with some of those like addictions that people have and, and some, maybe even some loved ones that have, have actually been, so, and they change, don't they? They're warped. They become someone that they were never intended to be because idols will always deform you. You know why? Because you will, whatever you value the most, you will become like. You will become like whatever you, you value the most in life. Psalm 115 says, those who make idols will become like them. That's, it'll warp you. It'll change you. And so will those who trust in them. See, we shape the idol, and then the idol ends up shaping us. You will become like whatever you put first, whatever has first place in your life and on your heart. So, so check it out, church. You better reserve that place for God because you will, you will be warped. You will be deformed from God's intention and God's design when an idol sits on the throne of your heart. Jeremiah says like this. He says, they worship worthless things, and because of that, we become worthless ourselves. See, idols will not just disappoint and dominate and deform you. I could have added a number four. Idol, idols in our life will not stop until they destroy you. They will, that is the end result. And check this out. None of us would have, if we would have knew the cost, if we would have knew the price, that it would actually be our destruction, none of us would have paid that price, right? If we knew the end result was the destruction of our marriage, we would never have said yes to that job, yes to that habit, yes to that relationship. If we knew the end result was our destruction, we would have never said yes if we knew that we were sacrificing our kids on the altar of an idol. We would have never paid that price. But it is the end result of an idol, of when it's something else other than God sits on the throne of our heart, it'll always bring and reap destruction. So here's the question. What do you need to give up? What is preventing you? What is, what is preventing you from going all in? What is God calling you to give, to give up today? It could be a relationship where you say, I know this relationship ain't right for me. I know, I know it's not right, but I'm not ready to let it go. It could be a career or a job that you know is taking you away from the values that you hold most dear and God wants you, but you say, no, 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 it's given us this and this and this and, and this kind of security. I'm not ready to let that thing go yet. It could be a habit where you know, man, God's convicted me. I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm just not ready to, to let go of it. Check it out. Listen, if God calls you to let go of something and you can't, then you don't own it. It owns you. What is, what is God calling you to release to let go of? Here's, here's the truth, you guys, not in your notes, but idols are defeated not by being removed, but by being replaced. So you can, you can, remove, you can remove that habit, and another habit will take its place. I promise you. You were created to worship. You will worship something. Something is going to take your affection and your time and your focus and your energy so you can get rid of that relationship. I'm telling you, another relationship will take its place. So you don't just dethrone your false idols. You get rid of them, but you replace it with the one true God who was designed to sit on the throne of your heart in your life. So we don't just replace. We are removed. We replace it. And so Joshua, again, brings us with this choice. In Joshua chapter 24, he says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers that they worship beyond the river and in Egypt. And I love how he calls the people back to Egypt. You know, the, the Israelites were in slavery for more years than the United States has been a nation. So they picked up, while they were in slavery, they picked up some bad habits. They picked up some, some, some false worship habits and, and customs. And he says, hey, you guys, you all need to abandon the gods of your forefathers that you worship beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. But he says, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, if it doesn't look good to you, then let's choose for yourselves this day. Let's make a choice. Who are we going to serve? And he gives them a choice, whether the gods of your forefathers serve beyond the river. And that's an option. You can serve, you can serve the God of your parents. And really, honestly, the, the, the easiest thing for most of us, what we've done is we just worship the same idols that our parents did. So what did your dad worship? Did your dad worship sports, cars, career, money, sex? What do you worship? What did your mom worship? Did your mom worship career or success or hobbies? 
He says, he says hey, choose. If, seem, if serving the Lord seems undesirable, then choose for yourself. Will you worship the gods of your forefathers that for generations have tripped up your name and your family, and you see the results? Do you want that? Go ahead then. Go ahead. Worship the gods of your forefathers. Or here's another choice, he says. Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. That's the, the God of the culture around you. And in that day, the Israelites, they had like a lot of like false, there was a lot of false idol worship in the land that they were living in. And although we don't have a lot of like, obviously statues and things like that, that I think though in our culture, there are still false idols that our culture is worshiping. I think they're hiding in plain sight though. It's the God of sex, the God of money, the God of pleasure, the God of success, and could it be that, that these idols are so prevalent and they're so common that they're hiding in plain sight and we don't even know that they're there and they're robbing us of the amazing things of the, the life that God promised. And, and, and could it be that Romans chapter 12 says we've become so well adjusted to our culture, we just fit into it without even thinking, running the same rat race that people are running, worshiping the same false idols that everyone else in our culture is worshiping. So Joshua says, look, hey, choose for yourself. You can choose your forefathers who you see for generations have tripped you up. You can go ahead and worship the God of the, our culture and see what the result is going to be. But he challenges us, and I'm challenging you today. He says, but as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going all in. And that's the challenge here, that I'm challenging you to go all in. Hey, what is, what is these false idols? What have they done for you? What is the God of success? Really, what, what lasting thing has it provided for you or your family? What, what has it provided in joy and produced fruitfulness or fulfillment inwardly? No. I mean, if we were honest with ourselves, they have, they have taken so much more than they've given. They overpromise and underdelivered. It's time to dethrone these gods, that these false idols that we've given our time and our affection and our hope. We put our hope into the wrong things. And Jesus is saying, come, follow me. At Psalm 86, it's not in your notes, but he says, among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. They don't even compare to you. Why would I want to go anywhere else? No deeds can compare with yours, God. So Jesus says, come, follow me. I don't want total perfection. You don't need to just focus on the rules. I want your whole heart. I want you to be totally devoted. And in the scriptures, we see some people say yes. And we see them, you know, fumble their way through it. Because they're human, they say yes, though, and they go all in with, with God. But others in the scriptures, they did not. They said no. They said, no, I can't, I can't go there. In Luke chapter 9, in your notes, you may want to read you know, before that, there was, in Luke 9, it tells a story of Jesus inviting people, come and follow me. And on three occasions, every one of them didn't do it. They didn't go all in. They didn't say yes and follow God. And for, and for all of them were for the very similar reason. Look here, Jesus says, come and follow me. And this guy says, I'll follow you, Lord. But first, but, but, but I'll follow you, I'll follow you, God, but, but first let me get some things. I need to fix this right. But first I need to actually focus on my career a little bit in my life. But first I need to do me. I need to focus on, but, 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 but first turn to your neighbor and tell him you need to get off your butt first. Come on, somebody, turn to him and tell him you need to get off the butt first. What you need to do is change your butt first. Instead of butt first being an excuse of why you cannot follow God, you need to change your butt first to butt first God. Yeah. Butt first God. So how do you dethrone the idols of our heart? You change your butt first. <laughs> change, you change your butt first from an excuse to butt first God. You put God first in every area of your life. You, you don't just dethrone. You don't just get rid of the habit. You don't just get rid of that relationship. You don't just get rid of that job. You put Jesus on the throne of every area of your life. So let me get really practical with you because, because serving God and going all in, answering the call, come and follow me, is not like some ambiguous, mysterious journey that, that is mystical and God wants to, sure there's progressive revelation and God wants to reveal things to you in a progressive way, little by little, but, but honestly, following Jesus and going all in is not an ambiguous journey. I'm going to give you five practical ways that you can go all in with God, that you can put him first in your life. You can put this into practice today and dethrone some of the false idols that have gotten in our way. Are you ready, church? Are you ready to go all in? 
All right, write some notes with me. Here's, here's the first area we need to put God first, and that is we need to put God first in our schedules. Put God first in our schedule. Um, how you spend your time reveals what really has first place in your life. If I could see your schedule and your calendar, would it reveal that God is first in your life? If I followed you around for one day other than Sunday, right? <laughs> would it reveal that God is a priority, is first in your life? Psalm chapter 5, verse 3, David says, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. If you really want to guard your heart from false idols, you need a daily quiet time with God. You need you, somewhere in your schedule. And I would say first, put God first in your schedule. I try to wake up every day and talk to God. No, no, no. Oh, but first I need to take a shower. I'm a little groggy when I wake up, you know, but, but first I need to work out. But first I need to check my email. But first I need to, let me check my social media. No, no, no. But first God. But first God, wake up in the morning. It, could be, it doesn't mean to be an hour, not even 10 minutes. It could be one sentence. Good morning, God. Sometimes I want to say, good God, it's morning. But either way, you're putting them in the morning, okay? Put God in. Put them first. Put, put them first in your schedule. If you are honest, a lot of you here today, you know you are overscheduled. You've, you've said yes to so many other things, you can't say yes to God. So when God comes and taps you on the shoulder and, and, and says, hey, I got an opportunity for you. It's an opportunity for amazing things. It's going to give me glory and it's going to work out things in your life. You're so busy, you can't say yes. You not only not say yes, but you see it as an inconvenience to your life. When God says, hey, this is for you. I got something for you. Oh, God, oh my gosh. Oh, I'm so busy, God. Another thing, that thing that was meant to be a blessing, that thing that was meant to produce amazing things in your life, you say, oh, I just can't say yes to another thing. That's because you said yes to the wrong things. The wrong things. Put God first. Create some margin in your life for God to do amazing things. For you to start saying yes to God. Put God first, but first God. Put him first in your schedule. Here's the second area. Today, you can start doing this, church. Today, man, put them first. Here's the second area. Put God first in your interests. In your interests. God wants to be first in our life, not just at church. Make him first by inviting him into, into anything and everything that you're interested in. Anything that you're passionate about, you invite him into that space. Put God first in your interests. Not just in, don't just put him in that box of spirituality. God, you're, you're first in my spirituality. But in my relationships, and in my career, and in my this, and in my this, I'll keep you over here, God. No, no, put God first in your interests. 1 Corinthians 10 says it like this. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Like whatever you do, whatever you're interested in, do it for God. This is why I love, we have at Discovery, we have um, interest-based small groups. That whatever you're interested about and passionate about, you can gather with like-minded people who are interested or passionate about the same things, and you can just do that and include God in that. So it doesn't matter. I don't care if you're passionate about going to the movies or eating out or, or, or couponing. It doesn't matter. You just What you do is you gather with other people, and you put God in that interest, and you give him glory. God wants to be put first in your interest. Here's the third area. God wants to be put first, and we need to put God first in our relationships. In our relationships. If you want to put God first, listen, especially young people here, please. Choose your friends carefully. Choose your friends wisely, because whoever you are spending the most time with, you will become like. Okay? So I'm not saying live put up walls and live in a Christian bubble. I got friends that aren't Christian, okay? I got people that, that I'm influencing, and, but, but the closest people, the people who are closest to me are the people who share my values and my vision of God. You know, because I, I want to I be, be rubbed off in the right direction. If you, want, if you truly want to guard your heart from worshiping, look, some of you, you got the wrong friends, man. Your, your friends are worshiping the wrong things, and they have, they're chasing after other things are sitting on the throne. And if you, just, if you aren't careful, little by little, you'll start adopting their values, right. their custom, 
their culture. That's why Jesus, that's why God said in the Old Testament, right there in the middle of that culture, he said, don't you dare fall into this pattern. Don't you let them infiltrate the camp here. I'm not saying build up walls and, and just live again in a Christian bubble. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying you need to choose your friends carefully. That if you want to put God first, put them first in your relationships. John chapter 13, Jesus says, a new command I'm going to give to you guys, love one another. Now he's talking about the actual church here, the people of, of God. He said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you're actually my disciple if you love your brothers and your sisters. And I don't know who I'm talking to for this part of the message, but there are some of you here that like people who aren't Christian more than you like people who are Christian. And, and, and it could be because you were hurt before, you've seen hypocrisy, maybe you, I don't know what it was that affected you from, from opening up to relationships and actually loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. But Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have so much love for each other that people look at you and say, they must, they must know Jesus. Can, can someone look at your life and, and see by the way that you treat your brothers or sisters in Christ, wow, that's what forgiveness looks like. Wow, that's what grace looks like. Can they see that, that you are Jesus' disciple by your love, your patience, your, your forbearance, your grace for, the brother, for brothers and sisters in Christ? If you want to live this God first life, you want to go all in, you got to put God first in your relationships and choose your relationships wisely. Some of you need to cut some relationships off and begin some new relationships, maybe even getting into a small group here this season to start some God-honoring relationships in your life. Here's the fourth area. We need to put God first in our finances. If, if Jesus is not Lord of all, what do we say? He's not Lord at all, okay? So it's all in. It's both feet. And this is an area we like to keep God out of. But if you want to guard your heart against false idols, put God first in your finances, why is it that a, that a $50 bill can look so big when the offering basket is passing by us, but can look so small when we're with our family at Chili's? Why is that? Why? Matthew 6, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for you'll either hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. Here Jesus is saying, My throne only has one seat. And I don't share it with anybody. You're either going to be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And that M is capitalized in money because that's actually the, the, the Greek word there is the God we, we looked at at the beginning of the service. Mammon is the actual word it's used here. The God of money. He said you cannot serve both God and money. Some people dismiss this principle all together. The principle of first. Listen, when you put God first in your life, everything else comes to order. Everything else falls in place. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect and you won't have any trials, but when you put God in his rightful place, everything else comes to order. Proverbs chapter 3 says like this, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. He's talking about the tithe, the, the first 10%, he says, belongs to God. And as for me and my house, church, I'm just saying, like before I even married Veronica, before I even proposed to her, I said, this is something we are going to do. We are going to honor God with the first because the first belong to God. We're going we're to make that priority, that commitment, that it's the first fruits of God. Why? Because then your barns will be filled with overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. God says money is the number one test of your priorities. You, you, he says, give me the first and I'll bless the rest. And, and God can never be anything in your life but first. He can't. He can't take any other place in your life. You say, wait a second, God can do anything. No, there's actually one thing God can't do. Do you know that? Here's what God can't do. God can't be second. He can't. It, this, the, the theological term for this is called the preeminence of God. It, the preeminence of God means that God is above all, more than all, in all, and first of all, he is first. He is preeminent. He cannot be, that's why his throne only has one seat. That's why if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all, because he cannot, because of his nature and who he is, take any other place in your life but what? But first. But first God. But first God. So put God first 
in our finances. Here's the last area we're going to talk about today. Put God first in your troubles. Put God first in your troubles. See, when you face unexpected problems and pressures, when you have crisis and hurts and heartaches, where do you turn to? Where do, you, where do you run? God says, turn to me first when you've got a problem, but first me. I want to be first. Turn to me. Before you go talk to your friend or your mom or your dad or, or your children, or you, 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 you go take that, drink that, go there, do that. Before any of that, but first God. Come to me, God says. I want to be your but first when the time of trouble comes. Psalm 50, God says this, and call upon me in the day of trouble. And I, he says, will deliver you. And, and if you do that, he says, if you do that, you're actually honoring me. You're giving me a place in your life that I was made for, I was designed for, I was created for. In the day of trouble, put me first. Church, we're going, we're going all in. And I just I come back to this question that, that Joshua gave to the people. If serving the Lord is undesirable for you, then choose for yourself. This day, whom we will serve? Will it be the God of your forefathers, your parents that they served? And you saw it, you lived with it, you go ahead. You, you, you want to serve those gods? You want to you chase after those things? Go ahead. Or, or do you want to fall in line with this culture? You want, you want to just kind of fit into it without even thinking, not even looking different, sounding different, living different? You want to do that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Choose for yourself. But church, as for me and my house, as for me and, my, and, and the Hannish family, as for me and Discovery Church, as for me and this house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Can I pray for you? Can we put our heads down? Can we just bow our heads? And